Insights on Jordan Peterson's Maps of Meaning Brought to you by InstaRead Have you ever wondered what's the meaning of meaning? What it means to mean something? How humans developed the concept of meaning and assigned one to everything they deemed important? If so, this book is for you. Written by Jordan Peterson, a well-known psychologist and philosopher, Maps of Meaning, 1999, aims to explain how our brains developed into being able to make meaning out of the natural and abstract world surrounding them. We have created systems that embody these meanings, give them value, and transfer them throughout generations via both myth and science. The synergy between the two is crucial for us to understand how we developed our ability to make meaning and to categorize good versus evil. Insight number one. Most people believe we live in a purely objective world, governed by science and matter. But this is not the truth. The world we live in is both objective and spiritual. We often overlook the spiritual aspect, or fail to acknowledge it completely, because it is impossible to talk about spiritualism in a scientific context. The fact that spiritual reality cannot be quantifiable leads many to believe that it's simply not there. Number two, words are not merely a descriptive label that we put onto things, but rather can be seen as tools that help us achieve a certain goal. These goals can be practical and material, or more general and conceptual. This is why we have words for things that cannot be materially described, such as love. We invented them as tools to use in discussing goals that transcend the material world we sense, which we can call the spiritual world. We can therefore say that science is not just a way to formulate theories about material objects and make them the basis of reality, but rather a way to formulate tools to help us better navigate the world. From this view, we can see that the objective world isn't that different from the spiritual world. Both are governed by systems of tools that help us navigate them. They're not real in the same way, but real nonetheless. Number three, it could be that we humans have evolved to put more importance into the significance of things rather than the things themselves so that the significance or meaning of something takes on a more real aspect than the thing itself. We've always presumed that nature, as opposed to abstraction, is concrete reality. But could abstraction be realer than nature? It could be that abstraction helps us perceive, through imagination, new levels of reality hidden within our senses. Abstraction could help us make sense of things, and make them feel realer than plain nature does. For example, when we say, I'm going to the river, we understand it to mean that the river is a certain place. In reality, the river is not a concrete place. It's ever transforming, the currents always carrying movement, new water, and new organisms. Abstraction helps us define a place as a set of constant relationships, which remains true despite constant transformation, instead of a concrete invariant material or natural object. In other words, abstraction helps us make places feel more real. The concept of safe places draws on this idea. They are places governed by stable relationships despite transformation. You don't feel threatened or unsafe because whatever happens in these places is predictable to a reasonable extent. They're an explored territory where actions produce expected consequences. Yet, in reality, or nature, there are no safe places. Everything is ever-changing. Even if an object doesn't change in the spiritual dimension, it may always be changing in the time dimension. Any place you enter will never be exactly the same when you enter it at a later time. This scientific definition of a place is one we don't identify with. Instead, we prefer the abstract definition of a place that possesses constant relationships between its elements, even if they change. 
This is one example of abstraction being realer to us than nature. Number four. Consciousness can be defined by a mediation between the natural and the abstract, the known and the unknown. Consciousness is a faculty that transforms the new into the familiar and could even turn it into wisdom. It's able to function thanks to language. Because of this, consciousness could arguably be the spirit, an active, ever-changing, dynamic entity not fixed or stable like a natural object. Our universe itself reflects the clash of consciousness. The cosmos is an amalgamation of order versus chaos. We humans as conscious beings are the ones able to make sense of this duality and extract meaning from it. We are the intermediary between nature and abstract, the key element out of the three that constitute experience, the known, the unknown, and the knower. Number five, myth plays a crucial role in human existence. Contrary to common perception, religion, ritual, mythology, and drama are not primitive forms of knowledge employed for lack of objective science, but rather elaborate tools we have constructed in order to imbue meaning into our lives. Now, more than ever before in history, we have some sort of explicit understanding of religion that is not shrouded in mystery as globalization allows humans to contrast and compare religious traditions around the world. Clear patterns are scattered across virtually each of them. One of those patterns between different religions and mythologies comes down to a simple element. Does it make a great story? Ultimately, the story of humanity is a classic battle of good against evil. Its meaning is derived from the never-ending clash of order versus chaos. Ever since humanity's dawn, resulting in more discovery and more unknown to be discovered. We hope you enjoyed this video. Smash the like button, leave a comment, and subscribe to our channel. Visit instaread.co to get more insights from this and thousands of other books. Use the code YouTube to get a discount on your subscription.